Good morning, good morning, good morning. How is everyone doing today? Uh, been a great weekend for me. I uh, don't know about you guys. So uh, yeah, raring to go for today's writing session. Let's try and get another page done today. Um, so we are coming out of the shipping container. Um, our, our protagonist has kind of um, got his plan to work. He's uh, He was stuck in there with 30... Um, Yakuza gangsters, and he managed to at least get uh, a few of them killed by uh, making them fight each other. And um, now the whole idea is that he has to, uh, he's, he's been picked uh, for the next fight, and he's going to get, uh, he's going to get hauled out of this shipping container and into this big uh, arena full of Yakuza gangsters, um, and he's going to have to fight for his life. So, um, I won't do a read through uh, of what we did last time. I think I'm just we're just going to get stuck into it, and then maybe at the end we'll do a quick read through to see if it all hangs together. So we ended the last page with uh, this compelling last line. You know, you he said, pointing at me. You're next. So uh, let's go from there. Um, again, welcome to everyone who's just joining, and uh, you know, comments are welcome in the chat. So. Uh, Okay, so we need a compelling first line. That's our first rule. If this was the first uh, line of the novel itself, would this be compelling? Uh, so, and, uh, and pulled me out of the shipping container into the shipping yard. Uh, okay, so it's night time. No, it's chilly and the... Uh, and we're at the port of Tokyo, right? So the, the there's salt in the air. I'm thinking that probably stings his, you know, our guy's, he's beaten up. He's got broken ribs. Uh, his face is cut a little bit. Um, so we can just reference that, you know, stung my cheeks, something like that. Just to give it a small sense of the ambiance. Uh, but really, we just want to get straight into the main bit. So, you know, he... Remember the shipping yard, let's think about this, it's, it's sort of laid out like a maze with all these shipping containers everywhere. So, and he's already said before, even if I wanted to run, I wouldn't be able to make my way through this maze of shipping containers. So let's keep that in mind. So he hustled me uh, between, uh, let's say, a row of shipping containers. Can you say an alley of shipping containers? Uh, no, doesn't sound right. A row of shipping containers. Um, let's just make this super quick. Uh, one second. Made a quick right turn. Um, and then we were in the middle of it. What happened to the music? Does anybody know? Uh, and we're in the middle of it. Okay. Um, how does that read? Uh, made a quick right turn. And then I think this needs a suddenly. Generally, I don't like to use the word suddenly, just but okay. Uh, I think that works. Okay, what happened to this music? What is going on? Wait a second. Um, come on. There we go. Okay. Um, so, yeah, uh, so we've said before, we sort of built this scene up. We imagine this is the port of Tokyo, the big shipping, uh, the big shipping yard, and what they've done is um, Sage Smiles, hello, how are you? Uh, great to have you here. Uh, are you a writer? If so, uh, let us know. Um, so we imagine we're in the port of Tokyo and the Yakuza has taken over this section of the, uh, of the port. And what they've done is they've basically made a huge clearing and they have um, sort of set up this essentially coliseum for all the Yakuza fighter, all the Yakuza henchmen who have disgraced themselves they are allowed to fight each other, and the winner of that tournament will regain his place within the Yakuza. Um, it's great to have you here, Sage Smiles, by the way. Um, first time chatter. Um, yeah, so if you're a writer, let us know what you're writing, and uh, have you been following along, or are you just joining fresh today? Um, okay, so let's, let's, start, um, let's start fleshing this out. So I imagine this place is sort of like a hexagonal... Um, a hexagonal thing, so a, uh, a giant hexagonal um, shaped clearing 
Let's have it bound on each side. Okay, so bound on each side uh, by hundreds of shipping containers uh, stacked, hun uh, stacked a hundred meters high, let's say. Hundreds of meters would be a bit like, I don't think that's possible. Uh, stacked a uh, hundred meters high. Um, yeah, uh, so we're writing here, this is a, a completely new novel, um, and this is all about uh, the Japanese Yakuza. Um, oh, this is great actually, so everyone, everyone else in the chat will know that we wrote, uh, we said that one thing to have in your novels is uh, one line near the beginning that just sums up the novel perfectly. So, for you, Sage Smiles, uh, let's see if we can uh, use that, um, that line that we wrote, which uh, should give you everything you need to know about this novel. And I think it's just at the end of chapter one, where we said, uh, here, this is it. So this should sum up the novel for you. Wonderful, she said, and so the 18th captain of the Yakuza served me tea and grapes and told me all about her twin sister, the seventh captain of the Yakuza, whom she wanted me to kill. And that, in a nutshell, is our plot. We have our protagonist, and he is basically caught between these two sisters. Um, it's a thriller, and uh, we are really writing the climax scene now, which we, uh, which we had some good ideas for. Um, so hopefully that sort of gives you an idea of what's gone on. Our guy's been caught. Um, plans have not gone according to their... Um, well, things have not gone according to plan, and now our guy is finding himself in a very bad situation. Uh, so let's write out this. Uh, so a, a giant hexagonal shaped clearing bound on each side by hundreds of shipping containers stacked 100 meters high. Um, Sage Smiles, what are you writing? Um, what is your genre, and how long have you been writing for? Um, okay. Let's say that, so it's night time, so we're probably going to have some flood lighting um, had been uh, set up all around, um, illuminating um, hundreds of Yakuza gangsters, um, and let's say seven fighting. I don't know why we've been calling them pits, I just imagine that they're sort of carved out like this you know they're like two foot three foot deep uh and they've just made these sort of rings where where they're going to shove the fighters um okay so you know it was it's a bit like a coliseum coliseum like that um okay something like that whatever again this is just the first draft we don't need to be too careful so let's have the crowd roared you know, as we emerged um, onto the sea. Okay, so our guy, he's, he's, sort of, he's just come out of the shipping container where they've been holding him. Um, he's been hauled out uh, and suddenly the bright lights are everywhere. They've got people screaming at him. He's probably going to be quite stunned. Uh, but remember, our guy, our protagonist, Oliver Sharp, he is quick. Um, Sage Miles, right? You are uh, your genre is romance and chiclet. Um, yeah, cool. Uh, we welcome all writers here, um, and it'd be great to uh, get your thoughts and uh, ideas, uh, both on writing, on what we're writing here, this thriller, and uh, you know maybe share some of your work too, like a few others have been generous enough to do. Um, okay, so. Uh... I stood there. Get rid of that. Uh, okay. Yeah. I think something like I stood there stunned, um, blinking. Right. So, yeah, blinking into um, the bright lights, and let's call it a hodgepodge. Um, of screaming faces. Uh, wow, thank you so much, Sage Smiles, for the follow. Um, really appreciate that. Great to have you. Uh, great to have you here. Like I said, um, 
Thermonics take a step back. You can imagine that the guy's a bit overwhelmed um, on instincts. Um, yeah, how long have you been writing for? Um, uh, have you been published? Uh, my first book, Hearing Voices, came out in 2017. Um, so, you know, uh, where can we find your work? You know, we all want to help each other. We're all trying to grow as writers here. Uh, so, you know, let us know all the different, uh, however much you can. Maybe maybe a, uh, a short synopsis of your work um, and we will uh, and we'll read it out. We'll get people uh, involved. Okay, so I felt my legs take a step back on instinct, but oh, so maybe then he just gets kicked forward by this guy and he's like, you know, get in the ring. Um, you know, they're treating him like dirt because to them he is. Um, got launched forward, uh, you know, by a, whatever, by a kick uh, to my backside. Uh, and I fell flat into the pit. Okay. Um, and this is that classic moment where the, where your protagonist, he just wants to stay. He's, he's, he's taken so much of a beating already. You know, I wanted to stay down uh, like that. There's probably a bit more to write about this. I, but this is just the first draft. So let's quickly... Uh, I heard a voice. This is definitely not going to be the line, but <laughs> I'm just going to put in something. Uh, or maybe not a, I heard a voice tell me, but I heard a voice, um, yeah, not unlike his ex-wife. Not unlike, uh, which is actually good. Oh, that actually something like this could work, because I think we said at the end of this chapter, we're finally, finally going to introduce this ex-wife who has come into power. Uh, so she's actually going to be there. So it's good that we um, keep referencing her. Not unlike Sabrina's, tell me. Uh, whatever, let's just move on to the next part. If there's something like that, that, that's what that next paragraph needs. So eventually, and then he's gonna obviously say, no, 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 I'm not gonna give in to that. Maybe we could reference what happened in the dojo with Kyori Matsumoto. You know, he's learned a bit of toughness from the, from the wolves, not sure. Okay, so I got up slowly. Uh, okay, so let's ha you know, my eyes had adjusted. He was just in a dark shipping container, and now he's in the bright lights, uh, the floodlights. And who does he see? Okay, so if we remember, his whole strategy was that he tried to get everyone in the shipping container to fight each other so he wouldn't have to get his hands dirty. Then they took one of the huge guys from the shipping container. Uh, and that guy's been fighting for the past, I guess, like 12 fights. So we need to reference that. Um, what do we have here? Uh, Sage Smiles, I've been writing ever since high school. However, I didn't really think uh, as writing as a career until college. I'm still working on my first book. School has kept me busy. Uh, I'm also a college student trying to write my first romance series and the first book for it too. Wow. Um, yeah, we have a few, um, we have a few uh, collegiate uh, writers here. Um, who is the other one? We have uh, someone else also doing their... Uh, who was it? Let me see. Um, I can't remember. We have a few though uh, who are studying English literature at college. Um, are you studying... you're studying English literature or not at college? Um, the fact that you're saying college sort of makes me think you're uh, coming in from America. Am I right? Am I wrong? Um, okay, my eyes had adjusted to the light now. I saw, so the big enforcer guy uh, waiting for me. Evidently, he'd won all the fights before, which, uh, by, which by my count was, let's, uh, We'll have to go back and actually do the maths um, in a second. So let's just say 12. Uh, he looked tired at least. Uh, bleeding from his, let's say he's bleeding from his chest and maybe uh, the side of his head. Uh, we'll have to be 
you know, more specific with this kind of thing because, um, so when our guy, remember, our guy is not a fighter. He is he is not the Jack Reacher. He is the, the cerebral, uh, you know, the sharp tongue. He's like Top Cat. Um, studying English, yes, you're from America. Cool. Uh, well, it is great to have you here, uh, as I said. Um, okay. So we're going to have to figure out how our guy, who's not a fighter, takes down this big enforcer who is clearly a very good fighter. It's David and Goliath. Um, so if I could get some blood. In. Maybe he does that thing, you know, that, I mean, they're, they're in the ports of Tokyo. So I'm guessing the ground is quite dusty. Um, maybe he can get some dirt into, into that bloody eye of his opponent and that will probably help. It's a classic thing. But it's, uh, you know, it's something we could maybe do into uh, his eye. Um, that wouldn't be a bad thing. So, uh, maybe that wouldn't be the worst. So here we just, so it's these little bits here, these sentences where we just, we really understand how our character starts to, you know, how he thinks how he thinks about fighting, where his mind goes to first, tells you a lot about him. So he's not thinking, how can I break this guy's leg? He's thinking, how can I blind this guy? Because there's no way that I can fight him one-on-one, -on -one, right? So it's not like our guy is a coward. He's just, he knows, he, he already knows I'm no match for this guy. And therefore it doesn't make sense for us to sort of have him say, okay, right, I am gonna, you know, attack him you know from the left and i'm going to do this like, fancy move our guy does not have martial arts training he's not he's not that character so he's he's thinking more from the streets he's thinking right i'm going to play dirty because i need to play dirty otherwise i'm not going to survive um so that's the type of thing that certainly my editor uh, who is a black belt in about five disciplines um as i've mentioned before uh she would uh definitely be um pointing these sorts of things out to me. So I'm passing along that kind of information to you guys. Hopefully it will help. Um, you know what else I'm thinking? So if this is the port of Tokyo and they've got these pits, I'm just trying to think how we make this into more of a, um, uh, like a, what's the word that I'm looking for? Like more of a spectacle. So I'm thinking that these, that so if there are, what do we say? Seven pits, right? If there are seven different pits, maybe you know those big hydraulic lifts, the forklifts that they have to move the shipping containers? Maybe they each, each pit has one of those hydraulic lifts stationed around it. And the hydraulic lift sort of has like all the cameras pointing down. Remember, this is, this is Japan, right? So I'm thinking Fast and the Furious, that kind of thing. Um, they have the cameras pointing down, they're filming the fights, and they've got big monitors, you know, these big Toshiba flat screens mounted all around this big area. And they've all got the fights going on on all the screens so the crowds can watch. They've got all the betting odds for all the fights. Um, you know, it, it's that kind of thing. They're probably broadcasting this to the wider Japanese underworld. Um, it's got to be... It's got to be bigger. Remember, this is our big climax scene, so we want to really set the stage for something, uh, something big to happen. They've got all the yakuzas. Oh, maybe as well. Um, we're dealing with shipping containers, right? So maybe if we imagine at, um, at a football match, you've got the boxes, right? You've got those uh, private viewing boxes. So maybe some of these shipping containers have been converted into, you know, uh, into these like private boxes where the captains of the Yakuza, who we've all met before in the previous chapter, maybe they're sort of looking around, you know, they're, they're, they're in those boxes, their own boxes, and they're looking on the fights, they're watching things unfold. Um, it's a shipping yard as well, so uh, probably there's a lot of contraband uh, in all these, uh, con in some of these containers. So we can probably use a lot of this stuff to just really flesh out this whole scene. I hope that's making sense. Uh, a lot of things going through my mind um, as I'm as I'm thinking more and more about this. Um, so let's let's use that um, forklift idea. I think that's quite good. Hydraulic forklift or lifter. Okay. Um, a part hydraulic forklift 
beside each pit held a uh, held a number and multiple um, cameras above. Um, no, no, okay. I don't think we can say that. Uh, a part hydraulic Ford lift uh, painted with the number. Uh, so this will be pit six, let's say. Painted with the number six held uh, multiple cameras above um, our pit. Okay, that that's good. So we imagine now that the, the uh, you know, this whole thing is being filmed. Again, the music, why does the music keep shutting off? That is, there we go. Um, okay, and those, and then those cameras are going to the feeds of the monitors all around. So the feeds went to the 50 uh, or so. Is 50 enough? Probably. Huge monitors uh, mounted all around the, uh, the clearing. Right, uh, they displayed um, all the information, statistics, um, as well as all the uh, betting odds. Okay, something like that, whatever. Okay, um, so again, I'm, I'm thinking this is very sort of Fast and the Furious kind of, uh, kind of thing. Um, We've got all this, these Japanese underworld, these, these cronies, they're all screaming and raving around these uh, illegal underground fighting rings. Um, they've all taken bets. I know what we need. We need, um, okay, so maybe this is pushing it a little bit, but we need like an MC. We need, you know, one of those over the top guys, you know, with the big sparkly blazers and the hairdo and the glasses. Uh, to, you know, sort of jump into the pit and he's, you know, you know, screaming. We've, we've also, you've got to go now to, you know, anime and that kind of thing to, to really bring out this larger than life character. Um, yeah, it's got to be something like that. Uh, so, what do they always shout in, in anime? It's like, Yosha! I, I don't know, I don't know what the word is, but basically he goes something like that. So he, he, this guy jumps into the ring Let's imagine him like sort of an Elvis impersonator with a big, let's say a big purple sparkly jacket blazer. Um, and he's going to sort of, you know, he's the referee, so to speak. He's the one that revs up the crowd. Are you ready for more? Um, that kind of, that kind of character. Um, so as a guy, you know, with an Elvis. Now, again, we need to be careful. One thing that I've, you know, I've told you my editors get get me on all the time is using pop culture references because they may not be understood by the by your readership. Elvis is probably a safer bet, um, you know, but it's something to be aware of. You don't want to alienate your readers, you know, if they go, well, who's Elvis? Um, OK, so we'll be careful on that. We probably will change it. Um, Let's say a sparkly purple blazer. Um, I'd say he jumped uh, into the pit. Uh, okay. And then, okay, I'll tell you what. We, since I don't speak Japanese fluently, surprise, surprise, um, let's just put it in English and then we will later on go back and, and, and phonetically write it in Japanese, uh, you know, when we edit this thing. Um, okay. Our protagonist speaks Japanese. We as readers do not speak Japanese. So um, so uh, we'll put it in Japanese, you know, are you ready for more? And then um, we'll say afterwards, so that our readers understand what's going on, uh, the crowd around us, notice the music has gone off again. This is getting annoying. There we go. Okay. Um, so the crowd around us roared that... Uh, they did want more. Okay, simple as that, right? And now, now the reader is sort of piecing together the information. They read it phonetically in Japanese and they're like, what? What does that mean? The next line tells them, oh, okay, I get it. Um, 
And we said before, that's another thing that we want to try and do in our, in our writing is let the reader work things out themselves. Don't make the writing too easy. Um, you know, we, we don't talk down to our audience. Um, okay, so uh, this larger than life character and made a joke about me, uh, being, you know, a little white rabbit, something like that. Uh, the crowd seem to enjoy it, and my opponent, you know, this big, this big guy, we can just imagine him just sort of snorting like, you're in over your head, you know. Our guy is like the only English guy there, surrounded by all these Japanese uh, mob members, um, you know, snorted the, uh, the same sentiment, uh, something like that, whatever, and then... Let's just, okay, uh, we're pretty close to the end of the page. Uh, so, what's our compelling last line? Remember our rules. We write a compelling first line, a compelling last line that make that forces the reader to turn the page, and then we stitch it together. So, actually, we broke that rule today. Um, but let's write a compelling last line. I think, basically, the fight just starts. Um, and it's got to take, it's got to take our guy off, off guard. So, uh... Let's say something like, and again, this is one of those ways where if you do write um, a compelling last line uh, and a compelling first line, that stitching them together gives you two boundaries which you cannot go outside of. So it stops you from waffling, right? And as we've said before, this novel that we're writing now, this does not have uh, you know, agency backing. This does not have you know, Penguin Random House breathing down my back saying you need to hit a specific word count of a hundred thousand words so we're free to make this as short and concise as we want um and make it all the better for that in my opinion um so i'm thinking our guy something happens which distracts our guy's attention and then suddenly he he, he comes back to this bigger than life character purple blazer uh, and he realizes the fight's already started and the and his opponent is coming at him uh, and then that Obviously, the reader then has to turn the page and go, oh, what's going to happen, you know? Um, I'd started the, the fight and the uh, big enforcer guy. Um, I hope this is all making sense, guys. Uh, but please let me know if it's not. I will do a quick read through of this chapter um, in a second once we finish this page. Uh, the big enforcer guy was coming... Uh, towards me okay um oh i know what could happen so maybe he his okay so yeah i was gonna write this um so by your leave remember the the, the yakuza they are uh, very very um uh, what's the word deferential to their elders and their superiors so uh we want to um have this purple blazer guy sort of looking you know he's he's amped up the crowd but before he can officially start the fight he sort of needs to get the nod from the japanese from the uh, the captains of the yakuza who are going to be in those private boxes maybe around the around the edge of the ring so this guy the mc he sort of goes he's amped up the crowd are you ready for more they've shouted yes he makes his jokes and then he says you know by your leave my lords um and then our protagonist, his attention is drawn away from the fight. He goes and he, he looks towards the edge of the ring and he sees, and we get the description of the of these private boxes. And then suddenly, maybe he sees, in fact, one of the captains. Maybe it's Kyori or, uh, or Mizuki from previous chapters. Um, and then suddenly he realizes the fight started and, and that's it. Uh, okay, so let's let's try something like that and see how it looks. I think we've got just about enough space to do that on this page. Um, so obviously we'll need to write this in Japanese. Um, so let's just put that in brackets as a reminder to do that later. Um, looking uh, towards the outskirts. Um, of the hexagon where I saw uh, so what did we say when I saw that a 
few of the uh, shipping containers uh, had to be converted into, do you call them private viewing boxes? Is that right? I just call them boxes, but whatever, private viewing boxes. Uh, I caught a glimpse of, okay, so the, they're, they're twin sisters, so he wouldn't, he wouldn't necessar necessarily be able to, um, you know, tell which one is Mizuki and which one is Kyori. Um, okay, this, this line definitely won't make sense if you're just joining for the first time. But uh, remember, there are twin twin sisters, um, twin Yaku twin sisters who are both captains of the Yakuza and both going to war against each other. Um, well, I could, uh, you know, think any further, and then we'll have that bit. Where did that bit go? Okay, I think this is basically it. Purple Blazer had started the fight. And the big enforcer guy was coming toward. Okay, and then we, and then that sort of leads us into the next page for tomorrow. Okay, so that's one page written today. Uh, that is our goal each day for everyone just joining. One page a day. It's not a lot, but it's enough that we um, make sure we hit that goal every day, and it compels us. It just um, it stops us waffling, keeps us keeps us honest with the writing. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and. Uh, see how this chapter is uh, is developing uh, we'll have a quick read through so this is sort of like the climax chapter um, so let, let's see how it goes um, okay we immediately see a mistake that should obviously be they chapter six all right so they grabbed two of us by force and told the rest of us to shut up or else we'd be shot and lose what little fortune we had left then they slammed the, shut the doors of the shipping container, plunging us back into pitch darkness. It was dank and cold inside. Nobody spoke, but I'd gotten a good look at everyone when they'd herded us up. Thirty-two of us total, now down to thirty. Two guys who looked like enforcers, a couple of skinny boys that might have been street lookouts, and the rest were about my build. The shipping container echoed as we shuffled about. I couldn't hear much outside except the muted roar of the crowds. I estimated about 600 people comprising every level of the Japanese underworld, all of them eager for entertainment, which in this case was us. Everyone inside the container worked for the Yakuza, or at least they had until they'd somehow disgraced themselves and gotten cast out. In the West, you got a pink slip. In the Yakuza, you got herded into a shipping container and told to fight your way out. This was our shot at redemption. The last man standing would be allowed to rejoin his clan at his former position. But lest you think the Yakuza have any sort of soft side, they profit quite well from this by taking bets on the fights. You had to admire their dedication to profit first. This needs a bit of work. It doesn't read quite right. Okay. Not that anyone was going to be betting on me, that was for sure. My ribs were broken, my left eye was swollen, and the salt air stung my wounds. I wasn't going to survive one fight, let alone more than thirty. I'd managed to talk my way out of Yubitsume, but I couldn't talk my way out of a solid steel shipping container. And even if I could, I'd still have to navigate the entire shipping yard around us, which amounted to a three kilometer square maze. So what the hell was I going to do? I reached into my pockets and came out with the rabbit's foot. Still not working, I thought acidly, but as my thumb moved over the soft hair, I remembered that time I'd taken Sabrina to a fancy art gallery one evening, and the curator had been wearing a mink coat. It was all mini quiches and smiles at first, but three hours later, that curator had a limp. Two of the paintings were torn, and the mink coat had red paint all over it. They just started fighting, Sabrina told the police later. They all suddenly hated each other. That was Sabrina for you. She spoke to you for two minutes and you wanted to kill someone. Or make love to them. Three or four conversations and she'd worked that gallery into a vicious frenzy. And those were the supposedly respectable Burgios. Thirty thugs from the Yakuza underworld, on the other hand. I put the rabbit's foot back into my pocket and shuffled towards a corner of the shipping container. I'd gotten a good look at everyone before, 
and I knew they didn't all belong to the same Yakuza clan. Four guys had matching neck tattoos of a snake, wrapped around a sword. That guy who'd slapped me at the captain's meeting, Captain Tanaka, had had the same tattoo. I'd also heard a couple of the guys mumble something about... which I assumed meant they belonged to Fento clan. Captain Tanaka hits like a little girl, I called out in the darkness. I hope nobody here is from his clan. Nothing happened. I guess they were all in shock from the sudden outburst. So I called out another insult, this time about Fento clan liking little boys, and got the reaction I was hoping for. But as soon as I was told to shut up, I shoved the guy in front of me as hard as I could, sending him crashing into someone else. The fight broke out immediately. Shouting, screaming, the sounds of my odds vastly improving. I dropped into a tight ball, hugging my knees to my chest in order pr to, pr to protect my broken ribs. I took a couple of stray hits, but managed to stay relatively unscathed. The brawl got louder and louder, until suddenly the lights went up, and three gunshots banged us into silence. The guys with the guns demanded to know what the hell was going on. Who had started the fight, they wanted to know, but nobody could say because of the pitch darkness. But certainly, it wasn't the token white guy sitting balled up in the corner. He probably didn't even speak Japanese, did he? Either way, the guys with the guns weren't happy. They grabbed another one of us for the next fight, but they didn't slam the doors this time. One guy stayed with us, gun in hand. Looking around the container, I saw the fruits of my labor. Three guys had just been shot and killed and pretty much everybody else was now injured. I saw broken noses, probably a few broken ribs too. A few guys had gone to ground like me, which was good to know because they'd be the ones I'd have the most chance of beating if it came to that. Unfortunately, the two big enforcer guys barely looked ruffled. I needed to make sure they got picked early. Better yet, I needed them to fight each other. This was the this was king of the hill. This was a king of the hill situation. So if they fought each other, only one of them would survive, and not without serious injury. Above all, I needed to make sure I got picked last. That was the only way I was going to survive. And actually, that wasn't the hardest thing in the world to achieve. There's a simple trick magicians use to force a selection. Pick any card, they say, but they've already set things up so that you'll pick the one they want. All you have to do is understand the psychology. Okay, so this was the bit that we said... We need to um, do the research on the, how the magician, how magicians really, you know, force a selection. Um, okay, think about a high school gym class. Which kids always got picked last? The weakest ones, sure, but more precisely, it's the unpopular ones. Put Roger Miller and Preston Cheese Wright the third as team captains, and you'll end up watching the rugby team kill the debate team. And these two guys with the guns also had a personal bias. They belonged to a Yakuza clan themselves, so they'd naturally want to protect their own guys in the shipping container. If I could buddy up to them, that would help. Every time they came back to collect one of us, I used this force strategy until eventually just five of us remained in the container. Two of those guys with the neck tattoos, a skinny boy, one of the big enforcers, and me. Okay, and then we said that he's going to try and do this... Uh, he's going to try and manipulate the choice... We haven't really uh, done the research yet to be able to fill this in, but that's something we can do in the second draft. Uh, you, he said, pointing at me, you're next. And then we come to today's uh, bit of writing, and let's see how it goes. So we have the, uh, we have the situation now in hand. Um, he grabbed my arm fast and hauled me out of the shipping container into the shipping yard. The night was chilly and the salt air stung my cheeks. He hustled me between a row of shipping containers, made a quick right turn, and then we were sudden and then we suddenly were and then we were suddenly in the middle of it. A, a giant hexagonal shaped clearing bound on each side by hundreds of shipping containers stacked a hundred meters high. Flood lighting had been set up all around, illuminating hundreds of Yakuza gangsters and seven fighting pits. Like a it was like a Colosseum. Don't know about this line. The crowd roared as we emerged onto the scene. I stood there stunned, blinking into the bright lights and hodgepodge of screaming faces. I felt 
My legs take a step back on instinct, but then my body got launched forward by a kick to my backside and I fell flat into the pit. I wanted to stay down like that. Let it be over, I heard a voice not unlike Sabrina's tell me. I got up slowly. My eyes had adjusted to the light now. I saw the big enforcer guy waiting for me. Evidently, he'd won all the fights before, which by my count was 12. He looked tired at least, bleeding from his chest and the side of his head. If I could get some blood into his eye, that wouldn't be the worst thing. Um, blood and dirt into his eye, that wouldn't be the worst thing. A parked hydraulic forklift painted with the number six held multiple cameras above our pit. The feeds went to the 50 or so huge monitors mounted all around the clearing. They displayed all the information and statistics as well as all the betting odds. Needs a bit of work there, okay. And then this guy comes out, Yosha, boomed a loud voice as a guy with an Elvis hairdo and sparkly purple blazer jumped into the pit. Are you ready for more? The crowd around us roared that they did want more. He pointed and laughed and made a joke about me being a little white rabbit. The crowd seemed to enjoy it and my opponent snorted the same sentiment. By your leave, my lords, said Purple Blazer, looking towards the outskirts of the hexagon, where I saw that a few of the shipping containers had been converted into private viewing boxes. I caught a glimpse of either Kyori or Mizuki, but before I could think any further, Purple Blazer had started the fight, and, my, and the big enforcer guy was coming towards me. Okay. Definitely a lot of editing to do with this chapter, to get it as good as we had the uh, first two chapters, uh, first few chapters, but I think we're it's starting to take shape. Um, am I participating in uh, NaNoWriMo? Um, yeah, not not quite. Um, I have done it in the past. Uh, I'm not really doing it this year. Uh, this is the first time sort of streaming on Twitch. So just trying to make this, uh, this channel as productive as possible and it, as informative as possible and as helpful as possible. Um, we'll see though. I mean, how many words have we done for this novel so far? Only 8,000. I don't know. Uh, we could try and do a race to finish uh, in time for the end of the month. Uh, 50,000 words, right? It's possible. Uh, but I don't think I could do it all on this stream. I don't have that long each morning to, to do it. Um, but Sage Smiles, are you doing are you doing um, NaNoWriMo? Or uh, is that something they, they do at like college classes? I don't know. I, I didn't study English literature at uh, university. I'm a physics boy. So, um, yeah. Um, I think basically though, this chapter is now starting to take shape. Um, I think definitely we can probably go in and add and expand um, a few of the details here because this seems like it's got potential to be a very, very epic scene. We can really set the stage, um, you know, with all these shipping containers, the contraband, the way that everything has been set up. We might not have to do it immediately now, but certainly tomorrow's page that we write, I think we have to delve into that a little bit more. We also want to, um, I think, to, I mean, tomorrow is the fight scene. Tomorrow is where our guy has to, uh, you know, fight this Goliath of an opponent. Um, and I think we said, rather than the reader's expectation, you know, which is our guy is somehow gonna manage to win this fight. I don't think that's the case. I think what's gonna happen is our guy, he almost gets the strategy to work and then ends up face down in the dirt. Um, you know, his broken ribs are too much. He gets really battered by his opponent. And then um, his ex-wife, the one that we've alluded to this whole time, the whole reason he's in Japan in the first place, finally, she comes onto the scene. Finally, she's revealed to us and she's in a position of a lot of power. And the story then, you know, takes on a new... Um, a new plot, right? So um, that's roughly where we are. Um, so no, they, they also don't do it in college, not that I know of. Uh, however, they do do it in some high schools uh, in the US. Wow, um, cool. Um, yeah, we didn't do that here in the, in the UK. Definitely didn't have, um, you know, a National Writing Month challenge or anything like that. Um, but that sounds cool. Hello to everyone else in the chat uh, who has just joined. Uh, really happy to have you here. Um, you have joined at probably the uh, worst time because we are uh, rough, we're about to end the stream. Uh, but if there are any 
uh, writers who have just joined, say hello. Um, let us know that you're here. Um, and do tune in again, uh, you know, tomorrow for the next part of this uh, of this stream, uh, where we will, we will write the next page and um, try and get, uh, you know, this this plot really, really in motion. So this is the climax scene, at least for the part one of this novel. That's where we are. Um, cool. All right. Any other thoughts? Uh, you know, guys, you can whisper them to me. Uh, put them in the chat. It's great to have everyone here. Um, and yeah, let us know what you're writing. We're all here to help each other. Okay, same time, same place tomorrow where I will continue to write before your eyes. All the old videos are available on the YouTube channel right before your eyes and on the highlights and Twitch if you want to catch up, see how this novel started. Uh, we are pantsing our way along, making it up as we go along. Um, so please do catch up. I highly recommend the first video of all of them. Um, so please do like, subscribe, follow along, and I will see you tomorrow. Thanks, guys. Have a great day.